The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Um, welcome to the Stoa. I mean, the Stoa is a place for us to cohere in dialogue at the knife's edge of what matters most at this very moment. <clears throat> I'm Nick Benjamin, your host for this second session with Sensemaker in Residence, Zach Stein. Last week, Zach introduced his approach to metapsychology and described a framework for exploring and understanding the psyche. So the structure, Zach's presentation will be followed by a Q&A. While Zach's presenting, please write your questions in the chat and you can unmute yourself when I call on you to ask your question. Um, given that this is being recorded and put on YouTube, just let me know if you want me to ask your question for you. Please say it in the chat and I'll, uh, and I'll do so. So without further ado, take it away, Zach. Thanks. Uh, super happy to be here again. Uh, sunny, kind of beautiful day in Vermont. And uh, feeling honored, kind of happy to just have the space and the privilege to dive deep into these kinds of issues with you folks. Uh, just kind of like holding the kind of grace uh, of the moment. Uh, so I'm going to do the slide thing again and try to get through the rest of my slides today because the plan is to leave the last two sessions as something like a practicum where we bring issues from our lives or from the culture and we have a little bit more discussion and try to apply the meta psychology so that's my hope so it's going to be like drinking from the fire hose again today where i just run through the slides and kind of just lay a bunch of things out. Um, I'm going to try to go through a little bit of a rehearsal of last time and then move through each of the three modalities of the psyche. So ensoulment, development, transcendence, <clears throat> and try to talk about how they weave together. Uh, so let me get the screen share and go in here. All right. So let's do this again, just to rehearse where we were. Um, so you'll remember it was like we did a journey through the birth and history of psychology after realizing that the issue of psyche was root <clears throat> to the contemporary meta crisis. Kind of went over a little bit of like my existential angst in graduate school when I discovered <laughs> just what a mess the field of psychology was as a science. And then my first attempts to use Charles Sanders Peirce's metaphysics to kind of rescue psychology from itself, to build a meta psychology that serves as a mediator between metaphysics and the sciences of psychology. Right. So that's the place where we're playing is in meta psychology, which isn't the science of psychology because it's critiquing it and norming it. Uh, but nor is it metaphysics. It's like the bridge between. And so that meta psychology move that I just made happens in other fields, too. And if you look at interdisciplinary uh, research, which is to say the people who reflect on the practices of interdisciplinarity, you'll find that, yeah, if you reach the high end of like biology, you get into something like metabiology. <laughs> and if you reach the high end of sociology, you get into metasociology. And many of those meta disciplines, which bridge philosophy and metaphysics and the discipline itself, many of them have commonalities. And that's where you get this kind of move towards consilience in the space of uh, knowledge construction. So this was an attempt to build a meta psychology off of purse, but of course, per dovetails, especially with Landry. And so, by the time two or three years ago, I returned to meta psychology as a focus, I had a, a, a better grasp of how that tripartite metaphysics, meta psychology, psychology thing could work. And so, this is what I'm presenting. So, transcendence and soul and development is my characterization of these deeper. Uh, kind of meta-theoretical and metaphysical distinctions that are, that are around. <clears throat> so you'll recall I broke these down into the different triads within them. Language, cognition, capacity as a set, 
involved with development, which captures a whole range of psychological disciplines, including developmental psychology, cognitive science, uh, et cetera. Uh, Insolment, image, imagination, personality, which captures usually what's called depth psychology, um, but particularly encapsulating more of the Jungian uh, and uh, even artistic and aesthetic dimensions of that element of psyche uh, and then transcendence, symbol, attention, consciousness. Here you also find uh, formal psychological sciences, especially affective neuroscience, uh, the study of meditation, altered states, things of that nature, but you find also where religion and psychology come together, um, especially in ritual and, and symbol and uh, transcendent consciousness and awareness. So that's the set and the idea is that this encapsulates everything that kind of wants to call itself the science of psychology, kind of organizes it, and then allows us to see that the psyche is actually very polysemic, which means it has multiple meanings and lends itself to analysis from all three angles <clears throat> at all times, <laughs> which means like if any behavior, give me any behavior. <laughs> and I can look at it from a developmental perspective, an insolvent perspective, or a transcendence perspective. And if you are behaving in the world, especially if you're behaving well, which is to say that it is uh, net generative to your own future growth and learning and positive to the environment, uh, all three of these are happening in your behavior in a certain way, which is, it's kind of like saying like your whole brain, your whole brain is actually involved in every behavior. Uh, so the, the whole psyche is actually involved in every behavior. So this is where it gets kind of interesting um, because when you look across these three, you will find that there are, and this is where the metaphysics comes in, deeper patterns that show up across all three. And this is an example. Now, stages and stations and phases are distinct because they don't work in exactly the same way but they're also similar <laughs> because they involve this kind of like rolling over and moving into uh, and having certain spaces that are containment and stability. Uh, so in the state place of stages where you're residing at a stage and then some kind of shift to another way of operating. And that happens in stations as well. And it happens in phases. <clears throat> so you got to see how these are like similar. The underlying thing metaphysically is, uh, what Bascar called you know, basically dialectic, what Landry would call the axiom two rotation. Um, <clears throat> but it's a common underlying pattern of all of them. But it's very important to see how they're different. Uh, so as I move through each of these later, I'll talk more about what the differences between stages and stations and phases is. Um, here I'm just saying that there's something that all three of these do, <clears throat> and it's that they transform. Uh, they transform through a rhythmic, identifiable pattern. Um, they also interrelate. Um, this is another example of an axiom two rotation um, from Landry's Imminent Metaphysics. Uh, so as I described last time, this is like an OODA loop. This is also like the circular reaction, which was this kind of basic early conception in psychology that Dewey and James and others toyed with. The basic idea is that in Solment, the domain of personality, you get a motivation, you get an image of this situation you're in and yourself. And then that basically propels development because the image is always a problematique. The image always has behavior required, action required. So you need to have capacity actualized. So you move into development, objectify the world, build the skill necessary. And then part of you somehow acts, choice, right? Um, transcendence is not otherworldly. Transcendence is actually like where the body is. It's about you as an uncaused cause in the causal chain. It's about the power of choice, um, but also putting insolment and development in view, both of them, which means it has a dimension of uh, witness or distance um, in any case. And then once you've chosen and acted, then the personality is back. And what's the image? Has the image changed? Have I became who I thought I would be from the action? Has it worked? Am I, have I resolved the tragedy or have I fixed the problem? 
um, and then it repeats, right? If it's working well, then this thing really becomes auto catalytic kind of psychic evolution structure. So as I mentioned last time, this is review still, uh, all four quadrants are involved in each, which means that moving through developmental stages is an all quadrant affair. Moving through stations of installment is an all quadrant affair. Moving through phases of consciousness and emotion is also an all quadrant affair. So it's not like they do kind of correspond with the quadrants, but it's not like one of them means this is this quadrant and this quadrant. In fact, they're all an all quadrant affair, which is key. And they all, as I mentioned, have these underlying dynamics, which are deeper and have to do with nonlinearity, phase shift, chaos and complexity dynamics, which means that there's, uh, there's nothing in this that is mechanistic. Um, and a lot of this is organismic in the Whiteheadian sense. And I'm gonna get in more into that when I get into development in particular. Uh, so as I said, they have commonalities, as I mentioned just now, the quadrants, the dynamics, the underlying metaphysical triples, um, but there's also distinct content form and process. And so that's where we get into like cognition uses language <laughs> and semiotics of symbol representation and objective frames, etc. You know, insolment uses image, right? Transcendence has awareness and symbol. So you'll see there's differences too. Um, and here's where it gets kind of interesting is that they co-arise, they mutually enmesh and they reciprocally enable and the reciprocally enabling is interesting. So one important dynamic that I'll get into is that, um, so you're moving around from installment through development to transcendence. When you reach certain stages of development and it kicks through and comes back to installment, you can actually open the door to stations of insolment through the actualizations of stages of development, right? So uh, an example of that would be that if you are pursuing the vocation of a healer, like a doctor or an herbalist or something of that nature, um, and you acquire a certain capacity of doing that in development, you have the languages of it, the cognition involved in making considered judgments and diagnostics, and you become capacity in that way. You've now opened the door to go through the kind of insolment process that is possible when you take on the responsibility of being a doctor healer, right? You can't go through that, those stations <laughs> of like the wounded healer and the moving into the like light of God type healing stuff. Like none of that starts to happen to you unless you've built the developmental capacity to step into the space of actually being that person same with certain forms of certain forms of teaching certain forms of science and scholarship uh, so the notion that moving through certain levels getting certain capacities can then open the door to certain stations is interesting uh, similarly stations <laughs> that are more let's say primordial to the deeper image of yourself uh, those will set the rudder for certain types of developmental things to come online right Some people at a very early age, it's clear that music, music is like in their soul, right? And then that produces them towards a certain kind of stage development in kinesthetic, musical, aesthetic dimensions. Um, so you can see this intermeshing and intertwining and it could weave similar stories about transcendence where certain states of consciousness become readily available, make it easier to move through certain stages, right? So you have to get how all of this moves together and there's a lot of complexity, which is like implicit in the model, which would take a long time for me to actually speak to, but there's a whole kind of like grid-like structure there. So, and then as we talk about the deeper dimensions, especially when we talk about them at the level of language of insolment, transcendent development, uh, to be careful, I will always make mistakes in doing this, but we have to be careful. Uh, these things aren't within the psyche. They're not like parts of the psyche, like a functionalist model. And they're also not structures, technically. Uh, I like to think about them as basically primordial categories in terms of which the psyche understands itself. Um, so these are part of the psyche's relationship with itself. Um, 
and therefore its relationship with other other quote unquote psyches, which is to say you and me, I and thou. Um, so it's, it's something that's emerged from that dimension of our experience. All right, so let's move through, let's move through each of the three. Um, and as I move through, I'm gonna be making meta commentary of how they inter interrelate, or at least I'm intending to do that. <laughs> so hopefully I'll be good to my own attention. All right, so there's a, when we move into the domain of insolment, I like to start with insolment, but you can start with any of them. Uh, the reason I start with insolment is because it's uh, the most imminent. It's the one that is, um, you could argue, kind of like begins <laughs> when the process has a beginning. It begins from who you are, right? Uh, begins from the root metaphors or archetypes in terms of which you understand yourself and the world. Uh, so James Hillman is kind of the key person here and the term in Solman is I read so much Hillman, I couldn't find that actual term, but he uses the word soul making. Um, researchers in the space, but Hillman is definitely the leader. Um, you know, ran the Jung Institute for a while, uh, met Jung on his deathbed, um, uh, deeply transformed the field of depth psychology, both in terms of crit criticizing the practice of psychiatry and psychology as a, like a medical biomedical discipline, uh, and also changing the stream of Jungian depth psychology uh, into something that um, became this flexible, uh, kind of flexible, deeply powerful um, set of frames. So I'm a big fan of Hillman work. A lot of what I'm saying here is just coming from, from Hillman. I'll try to mention some books along the way. So image, imagination, personality and stations, right? So this is, this is what that play in insolment. And so the key dimension of, uh, let's say, growth or deepening that takes place here uh, is characterized by Jung basically in terms of emotional maturity or individualization. Um, uh, it's also posited as one of the dimensions of Maslow's developmental uh, model. So you have to get that many, th much psychology that's gone on uh, has put a couple of these in the triple together. So like Maslow's development, developmental model and some ego psychology models like Lovinger actually blend insolment and development together, which isn't a problem. I'm trying to differentiate them a little bit for clarity, but ego development and you know Maslow's model and some other ones blend them together. Um, but there's elements of Maslow's model that, gets, that are station-like and that work with the image of self. Um, and so the, to even begin to move through this, we need to clarify what do we mean by an image? Uh, and what do we mean by a station? So I'm going to set down some terminology and then that'll free the conversation up so you can see what I'm talking about. So that's a picture of a symbol. Symbols are extremely powerful and they're extremely universal and they are attached basically to the, this modality of the transcendent. Um, the focusing of awareness and there's a impersonal element where I actually uh, kind of de-identify with the local ego and identify with the symbol beyond. So that's kind of an important difference. I'm going to move between them. So that's a painting of an image, right? Giotto, uh, one of the very kind of first uh, people to use what we would call modern perspective. Um, so you can see that within the image, so let's say I have a dream and I have a dream that's basically a reconstruction of the crucifixion. It looks a little bit like this. Within the dream, I can extract a symbol. And this is a lot of what happens in dream analysis and psychology. You have a dream, there's a cross in it, and I say, ah, the universal symbol. See, your dream points you beyond yourself to something universal, right? Um, 
But what you're neglecting are the details of the image and actually the uniqueness of the image. Because if I have a dream about the crucifixion, it's likely that either I'm on the cross or I'm somewhere in here as a character, right? Um, so like, look at the guy on the right who's with the Romans, presumably, who has one of the halos over his head. Like that would be an interesting dude to be in this image. If I knew more about <laughs> Christian, uh, someone probably knows who that is here on the call, so put it in the chat, but I'm sure that's a identifiable guy. And then the angels, like look at the angels who are tormented. The one on the right below Jesus's armpit exposes his chest in, in turmoil. So like the richness and the detail of the image is where the image is at. Like that's the point of the image. So it can be relieving if you're overwhelmed by the complexity of your own image of self. Uh, it can be relieving to find the universal symbol in it, which identifies you with the transpersonal which gets you out of the complexity of the omniscient, trying to understand developmentally what's going on in the image and the torture and the tragedy of the image, and pull out the cross and boom, you've moved your attention has switched phase shift and emotion and you see the transcendent, right? So that's a lot of what's useful to do in dream work. But for Hellman, uh, and I would say from the perspective of insolment, uh, the idea is to actually linger and deepen within the power and unicity, uniqueness of the image. Um, and so here's another image, right? This one's the return of Persephone. Uh, so that's Hermes who's rescuing Persephone from Hades, returning to Demeter, uh, her mother. Um, incredibly powerful image. But you have to get that an image is, always has a context, a setting, and a mood. So not all pictures are images. Images are mythogems, or I can't, I don't know how to say that, but it means basically means like fragment of a myth. Uh, and uh, so this one's powerful, right? I mean, the gesture of openness, like Demeter looking like a little bit like Christ there on the cross, uh, but then the proneness of Persephone's head, um, the composure of Hermes, uh, the plant down in the lower left, likely to be aconite, which is uh, grew from the saliva of Sybaris, the three-headed dog at the door of Hades is actually an incredibly poison. Uh, it's my wife, uh, Megan, she identified that in this image. So there's richness to an image, a uniqueness to the image, which you don't wanna, so what you could do here is you could say, ah, the mother, mm, the mother, right? And you could extract the mother archetype into the realm of symbol from the richness and unicity of that, right? Or you could do it with any of the figures in it, right? Um, and so I'm not saying don't do that, <laughs> but I'm saying that's not the only thing to do with image. You can move to the impersonal universal symbol, or you can stay and clarify the unique, uh, clarify the uniqueness of the image itself. Um, so this, from one of my favorite movies, uh, The Fountain uh, by Darren Aronofsky. Uh, so this is another potent image, like a fragment of a myth. And you don't even need to know the whole story here, but there's enough complexity within the moving parts here that you can describe it in this crazily textured, imaged way. So, right, it's like, I stand at the edge of my world. A woman walks to me from a tree, right? The trees died space all around, something like that. It sounds like you're rehearsing a dream. And then for Hillman, what you do is you would move through the different components of the image to try to clarify the archetypal nature of the image. And we'll return to that. But you can see what I'm getting at is that these are paintings and screenshots from movies. Uh, but you could put your dream from last night right there. Like, and that's the insight is that the image is the like, it's what we traffic in when we traffic in insolment or personality. <clears throat> so you could also put the spontaneous constructions <laughs> of your imagination during the last time you cried, lost your temper or could not sleep. So dream is the classic kind of place where we go to look for the images that are emerging from us. But so are domains uh, 
any domain that lends itself to quote unquote constructive imagination. So this can take place in meditation, practice through uh, intentional exercise, uh, but the psyche generates image. Like I said, it traffics an image, at least a third of its activity, <laughs> maybe more, is image, metabolization uh, and production. So a lot of what you're doing in kind of like psychotherapy, quote unquote, uh, uh, and other practices which are ensoulment oriented is finding ways to catch the image, right? And work with it. <clears throat> and so that's why when I've spoken about like crying as a practice of ensoulment, that's what you're actually trying to do. It's like a practice of constructive imagination in many ways. You're trying to see what, what is the unbearable image, right? That's actually haunting you subconsciously and eating up all of this emotional energy to keep out of consciousness, <laughs> right? Uh, and identifying that, seeing what it actually is, working with the unicity of the image, because it's something to do with your uniqueness in relationship to others in the world working through the unicity of the image then can actually free that energy. Um, and so then you go deeper. Now you've gone deeper because you've just confronted something you're actually terrified of. Um, you've gone deeper into the unique story of the ensoulment. So a couple of things here, because we're talking about images. So you're getting a sense of what I mean by image and the kind of work that we do at the psychological level with image, right? Um, you could argue that people who are more deeply ensouled, let's put it that way, who've moved through more stations, right? Uh, and I'm about to speak about stations. The stations have to do with those kinds of transformations and resolutions within the archetypal imagery of self. Um, and so eventually that becomes conscious as, I'm, as I've been describing, it become a practice. You become aware of the products of your imagination and aware of the metabolism you have of images with the world, which include memory, moments captured in life that stick, right? Also the works of fiction and your own dreams. That becomes aware of itself. And so deeply mature, kind of ensouled people typically have rich storehouses of imagery and often end up speaking in a uh, richly imagistic metaphorical language. Um, so there's more about that. But when you're talking about images in particular, you're talking about arch archetypal images. Um, there's a couple of things we, we don't want to get kind of uh, stuck on. Uh, so the whole like what are archetypes discussion is an interesting discussion. Um, but we're talking about archetypal images as opposed to talking about archetypes. We don't need to essentialize the archetype as often happens with the practice of removing the symbol from the image. Um, so when you say that an image is archetypal, it's different than saying that there are archetypes in the image or that there are archetypes up in some platonic realm, which like manifest in this image. You don't have to say that to say that the image is archetypal. To say the image is archetypal is basically to say that it's very richly textured. <laughs> Uh, with certain potentially universal connotations. And so like in the Demeter one, right? There was a mother archetype. There was a daughter archetype, right? There was a light, darkness, heaven, hell archetype, right? There was also like the Hermes healing and kind of be between world communication, right? All of those archetypal dimensions of the image. Which one's primary? I don't know. Depends who had the dream. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to speak about archety archetypal imagery without getting into metaphysical debates about archetype. Um, although those are interesting. This is not the lecture for them. And I'm taking more Hillman's uh, perspective here, which is to askew that metaphysical conversation and actually focus on archetypal imagery, which means that even if the archetypal image you're looking at isn't technically connected to kind of any of the pantheons of archetypes, right? Uh, you can still have archetypal imagery in everyday life, which is seemingly non-divine or transcendent. Um, and then so the idea there is that, again, as I mentioned, the stations like a pre-tragic, tragic, 
post tragic um, is uh, well, it's it's almost perfectly represented in the uh, myth of Persephone, right? Pre tragic Persephone picking flowers, <laughs> right? Kidnapped into the underworld, stuck completely in tragedy. Um, but then comes back from the underworld, but has to go back there every once in a while, right? Is in a post-tragic situation, pre-tragic, tragic, tragic post-tragic. Uh, and so that's a transformation of the basic imagery of the myth. And you could grab images from each of those stations, right? And so when you're looking at your insolment process, that's about not am I becoming more developed and complex as a thinker and not am I deepening awareness of symbol, control of attention, phase change, like meditation, kind of, that kind of stuff, uh, or ecstasis, and, uh, you know, altered states of consciousness. It's not that. Um, it's about that. that is the basic root metaphor or archetypal image of self changing in the way that they change in mythic structure, um, for example. Uh, so that's that notion of the station uh, where in development, what's being moved between stages, if you will, is cognition, language, and capacity. In insolment, what goes through this, the movement of stations, right, is image and imagination. Like, and when you think of the imagination, not just as something happens with your eyes closed, but again, a third of the entirety of my experience right now is the imaginal, uh, which is technically true. Like, you know, I can't see the room behind me. Well, I can in the video, but usually one doesn't see the room behind me. I can't see my kitchen, but it's there, right? Much of the world picture that I'm holding now is actually projected by the psyche as imagination. So again, each of these could be a lecture in itself and the history of the idea of the notion of imagination from the medievals and through Kant and then to people like Jung and Hillman. Uh, it's a rich conversation, but it's important to get that when the root archetype in the image of self changes, my imagination itself changes. So that's what it's like to feel different in the world because you're projecting a different imaginal field onto the world, holding a different image of self in relation to others. So it's a deep change when you go from pre-tragic to tragic, right? A lot of people are at, that's happening to a lot. <laughs> that's happening like most of the Western world right now, <laughs> even though we've seen tragedy before, it's been long enough that we forgot. And there's all of these pre-tragic socialization contexts. Uh, so to move into the tragic is intense. It's a whole shift in underlying archetypal structure and then a change of what the imagine of itself. Uh, but there's a movie on to, to post-tragic. So, uh, so basically the way this cashes out in personality uh, is that as I was describing this, this transformation of these imaginal schemas of interpersonal interaction. So it's, it's literally the image of the self in relationship and that relationships to other people and to the, to the, to the physical world. So who am I? What am I? The way you answer that's not with, language and cognition, the way you answer that's with something like an image of the self. It's pretty root. Um, and uh, so there's a lot more to say there, but I'm going to move on to development. So in we move through stations. And as I said, uh, certain stations can't even be moved through until there's requisite levels of development. You may recall certain stage acquisitions, open doors to stations and vice versa. Uh, and then all of that's wrapped into what you can do uh, with your awareness. Uh, and so I'm going to speak to development here uh, in some detail. Uh, so there's Piaget's bald head. I don't know if you can see it, but this is Piaget's office. Um, and the reason I use this picture is because development is messy. The uh, stereotypical picture you get of development um, uh, from Piaget in textbooks um, through like Kohlberg, uh, Strawman, uh, Keegan, um, other folks. It's just that there's this ladder, right? That there's just these stages. There's like seven stages and we give them colors and we fetishize the stages and we talk more about the stages 
than about, let's say, how you move between them, which is weird because that's actually hugely important. <laughs> and we use the stages more like stereotypes to categorize cultural groups uh, or diagnostics to denigrate uh, individuals. Uh, and we don't think about what does development actually look like. Um, and when you actually look at the domain of development, uh, and I'm not even talking about insolment, I'm not talking about any personality, emotional dynamics at all. I'm talking about skill acquisition, language development, uh, capacity development across various domains. Um, it is massively complex. It's a, it's a complex dynamical system, which Piaget knew. Um, most of Piaget was not translated into English. And in the 80s, it was very popular to build your career on basically burning uh, Piaget effigy. Um, in fact, he was one of the most profound epistemologists of his generation, maybe any generation. And he was a complex dynamical systems thinker. And so the view I'm going to show you of development here um, is different from what you'll get in a lot of models. Um, and it's the only one that I think that I can actually fit with this broader picture. Because as you saw, insolment was about unicity, right? Insolment was actually about not trying to find this universal thing in the image, but actually trying to linger in the complexity and unicity of the image. Um, and similarly, development is actually not about trying to put yourself at some abstract universal level. <laughs> it's about understanding the, the unicity of your own developmental patterns and trajectories and skill sets and things of that nature. Um, so another deeper metaphysical dimension behind all three is uniqueness. So language cognition capacity. These, in a sense, are deceptively uh, the image, imagination, personality was like they were already ambiguous. So you were kind of like on alert that uh, you need to pay attention to definitions. Uh, these ones we think we know what language cognition and capacity are, um, but they're actually quite complicated terms. Again, this could be a lecture on itself just about development. Um, stages again, deceptively simple term. Um, stages, levels, tiers. Uh, orders. There's a lot of ways that the developmental kind of like uh, thresholds are described in the literature. I'm going to use stages and levels mostly interchangeably here. Um, but here's the actual place to start. Uh, so this is Baldwin from Psychological Review in 1904. Uh, it's an essay called The Genetic Progression of Psychic Objects. <laughs> Uh, and so I don't know if you guys know integral psychology, but in the back of integral psychology, there's this set of tables where Ken Wilber lays out like dozens of different models across a common developmental space he calls altitude. Uh, so this is Baldwin doing that in 1904, uh, where he basically says, listen, okay, we know development's universal across all psychological functions. So I'm going to spec out along a common developmental kind of axis what the different genetic progressions would be through the different areas of the, the mind. So he looks at the way logic progresses, moving from the second from the left, pre-logical, quasi-logical, logical, extra-logical, hyper-logical. Well, that sounds pretty dope. What the hell does that mean, right? Uh, but this looks a lot of like what developmental theorists do. Uh, today, and then it goes all the way through modes of individuation, reality, attention, modes of control. It's a whole thing here. Baldwin's an amazing theorist. But the idea that he had here was that, okay, when the mind develops, um, Piaget would say the same thing, um, you know, a few decades later. Uh, when the mind develops, it, it doesn't actually go through stages all of one whole. Right? So this is that simple ladder view that you begin your whole uh, let's say everything's defined by being pre-logical uh, and then everything all of a sudden moves up across all that's defined by being quasi-logical. Uh, that's not the case. Not what Baldwin said then. Uh, never really what Piaget said, um, but it is what you hear from some developmentalists now. Uh, the actual idea is that you could be farther along on some of these lines than others and that there's a non-synchronous, right? Uh, which is to say, not all synchronically moving up at the same time across temporally, 
there's developmental differences. So you're looking at a kind of like a, a distributed set of skills that develop asynchronously into this kind of like dynamic developmental profile of skills. So this is Baldwin's view, it's very important. So, and it ended up that the research ended up kind of playing out that way that these different domains of development emerged. Um, so the cognitive and the moral, that there's a difference between building skill in operating with the world, uh, like physical objects and causal systems, and, there's a, and that, and then building skill and language and operating in the social domain, that those are distinct and that they develop asynchronously, but in relation. That was an early insight. So this is Baldwin and Piaget both making that split. And I've kind of like summarized some models across a few books, um, but this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, I'll make these slides available on my website um, once the, all the lectures are, are given. Um, so a -nom all the way on the right, anomy, heteronomy, socionomy, autonomy. These is the way I characterize the Piagetian moral stages. Autonomy being what we would call post-conventional, socionomy being basically what we would call conventional. And uh, well, no, those middle two, heteronomy and sociomony being conventional, anomy being pre-conventional. Um, so, and then there was more work done. Kohlberg focused on the moral line in depth. Armin focused on a line adjacent to the moral line, which is this line of reasoning about the nature of the good as opposed to the just. Fowler with faith reasoning, his models become quite famous. Keegan with self. Uh, so similar idea that what you have is like a whole bunch of different ways of slicing this developmental pie because you actually have a massively distributed set of differentially developing skill sets. Um, so like almost anything you can speak to or operate on can become an independent developing skill. This is from Fisher's skill theory. And then skills weave together into skill domains where there are prerequisites that certain skills need and you use old skills to build new skills and things of that nature. So when I, a contemporary set of people who focus on the underlying cognitive structures, which end up being uh, probably best encapsulated in uh, Dawson's lectical assessment system and Commons's model of hierarchical complexity. And so the model of hierarchical complexity, hierarchical complexity, it's a little bit difficult to say, is uh, you know, featured pretty prominently in, in metamodernism, uh, the Hansi Freinach's books and others. Uh, you know, I worked with Theo Dawson uh, for many years at Lectica, operationalizing that in assessments of um, uh, developmental assessments, standardized developmental assessments. So that that's like when you think about like the peak of like the science of the study of developmental stages, it's, it's around that consolidation of a common underlying metric of hierarchical complexity, which is actually underlying each of the skill domains. Um, uh, and so it tells you very little. It tells you how much abstraction and complexity is embodied in a particular task. Uh, but it doesn't tell you if the task has been accomplished well or not. It doesn't tell you if the person wielding those skills uh, is moral or anything of that nature. But the distillation of the model of hierarchical complexity basically marks the kind of like watershed moment in the study of development. Uh, I think comparable to Hillman's uh, isolation of the archetypal image um, as the root of insolment uh, station navigation. So, and the model of hierarchical complexity can be interestedly represented like this. This is something that Kurt Fisher probably drew on the back of a napkin in 1980. Uh, and it was one of his kind of most famous papers. Kurt was my advisor, uh, um, recently passed away. Uh, and, but this is an interesting distillation. And this is again, similar to stations and similar to phases, <laughs> but different, that there's this change, like a change of state, like a qualitative jump, um, where the output of that lower level system, the cube, the cube becomes the basic element, 
of a next system which produces an even much higher order output. Um, uh, and so this is like a, a model and a simplification of the underlying structural properties of cognitive development in a whole bunch of domains. Um, and I'm staying extremely abstract, uh, but you can find this discussed about in more depth uh, on the Lectica website. There's a bunch of learnings um, specifically about how to speak through this in, in specific domains. I'm not gonna do that. I'm staying at a very high level. Um, and then as I described it, you know, so that's the way the thing moves. It moves through that deepening of abstraction and complexity, but it also doesn't move up a ladder of that. It moves out across a dynamic developmental web, right? Where the uh, skill development is very domain specific and very context specific. Um, so you can develop social skills, quote unquote, in the context of online video games, right? But that's a very specific skill stack, like a very narrow area of this web in the broader social skills domain <laughs> is text intermediated, like competitive game skill building with males, or something like that, right? So like, and then the idea that, okay, those skills now transfer to the rest of your social skills is complete nonsense unless you've found a way to get them to do explicitly thematized transfer across domain, right? Otherwise they're just, different. Similarly, in school, if you teach about critical thinking, let's say in sociology class, right, uh, it's very easy for kids to leave and they build them thinking about, oh, social issues are amenable to critical thinking and they apply critical thinking skills. Uh, and they built a skill set of like doing that, bring them to science class, uh, and they may or may not apply that skill set to critically thinking about the sciences, right? So you can get people who do social critique all day who will just believe medicine. They're just like, I totally buy medicine. Like, give me a vaccine. Proven by science to work. But then they're like, boo, and they social justice capitalism and they critique the hell out of it because they're good at critique social systems, but they're not deepening the critique into the whole... <laughs> Into, into all realms where they could apply their critical faculties, right? So that notion of like domain specific skill acquisition and skill development up the model of hierarchical complexity and then moving out across webs. And then the more attention you give to certain elements of the web, the more that part of the web grows and less this part of the web grows, right? So there's actually an evolutionary competitive tension between skills within your own development. Right, uh, and this is a big tension that emerges, especially depending on the image of yourself in the domain of ensoulment. When you move into development, start thinking about what do I want to develop? Uh, you realize that skills compete, skills compete for time and attention. Uh, and your analytical faculties uh, and critical faculties as I described it um, are not easily generalizable if you're taught to uh, just focus them on some things. Uh, so similarly, uh, your ability to exercise those critical thinking skills that you learned in sociology class uh, is going to fluctuate on context. So this is the notion of functional optimal level. When you're in class and your teacher's there and the books on the desk and your supportive classmates are also engaging in critique, you could operate at sometimes two levels of hierarchical complexity beyond where you normally perform. Now you go home and you're sitting around the dinner table and you're with your parents and maybe a friend and you're trying to rehearse basically those same points you just rehearsed in class like four hours ago or something. Uh, and you try to do that then and you get some disagreement and then you, you, can you can drop down to what's sometimes just uh, and operate two complexity levels below where you were operating in class, right? And you may not or may not be aware of that depending on your transcendence ability and the emotional state you're in <laughs> and the intensity of the charge of the image of self of being the person who talks uh, critically or whatever. Uh, so this is another important point, right? It's not a ladder, it's a web, and it's not you're at a level, it's that you're in a range which fluctuates a lot depending on context and where you are in the web. 
Uh, and it's all dynamical. And this is some of the most innovative work, work that Kurt Fisher ever did, where he took mathematical models that he actually did what the dynamical systems scientists did uh, at the kind of Stanford Institute for the Advanced Study of Behavior or something like that, him and Robbie Case and um, uh, Paul Van Geert. Uh, and so they put in the parameters of theoretical models into dynamic, system mo dynamic systems modeling uh, software. Uh, and they started to show that, okay, if you do think of skills in this way, in terms of hierarchical complexity, self-regulation and differentiated growers, which is different skills competing for time and attention, you can actually make a system that moves through a series of wave-like stages. Um, so this was like a, some kind of like theoretical experimental psychology where the math itself shows you the coherence of the basic underlying theoretical frame. It's another conversation, but these are the two most interesting models that Kurt produced. One just basically shows that on the left, uh, you do get these wave-like stages of growth over time, even when you have competing systems that, that they can cooperate. Uh, the one on the right, this is called the Piaget effect. If you take one of the growers, right, one of the skill sets, and you kind of focus on that one to the detriments of others early, so this would be like taking the math one out and just drilling the kid on math, or like Tiger Woods, you take the golf one out and you just drill on golf, <laughs> right? You end up dysregulating the, the whole system, and then the final output is a spread, a much more differentiated developmental profile, which means you're like all spread out across different levels, different skills are at different levels, which is hard for the self system to hold together. And so this is like part of what you get when you start thinking about like one dimensional man and the distortions of personality in modern educational systems. It's this kind of dysregulation of coherent skill integration and development through kind of like abnormally trying to boost certain skill domains on certain timelines. Um, so, so that's interesting. When you start thinking dynamical system wise and you start thinking about multiple growers uh, as opposed to start thinking about, oh, wow, yeah. Interventions in cognitive dimensions of growth have ramifications throughout the whole cognitive system and the notion of like uh, what the power of integrative uh, curricula in particular become extremely noted. Uh, again, there's, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm moving so fast. There's like so much more to say. So I think this is the last one. No, there's one more. Uh, so now we're getting a micro development. So this is again, you're drinking from the fire hose here and there's a lot of resources on this. Uh, so we just saw that like there's dynamic patterns of growth and there's interrelation between growers. Uh, and now we're seeing that if you look at this, so this is an exchange of two people. They're speaking uh, about a little robotic toy that they're trying to fix that's on the table in front of them. This was an experimental situation that uh, Kurt and his colleagues set up. Actually, no, it was Nina Grineau who set this up. And basically over a matter of like an hour, their conversations move at least three different levels of development within that hour. So there's a common misconception like, okay, you're at post-conventional, you're like quote unquote second tier or you're yellow or whatever, right? That means that you're always yellow in all contexts, always operating at a certain very high level of development, but that's just completely incorrect. Uh, development and what's required of you is context specific. And there's overwhelming evidence as this simple experiment shows that when you're talking with someone else about an actual problem in the world, you're forced to move up and down the developmental register. Like they had to like the, the ones down in the one that's actions. That's literally picking it up and looking at it and saying something concrete about it. <laughs> and then they start to extract up out into representations and abstractions about the object. So when you look at microdevelopment, you're actually seeing these patterns of moving up and down the developmental register very consistently. And it would be a pathology in this case to only speak about this thing in the abstract because you actually have to pick it up. 
and name things and use indexical pointing procedures in the actions and representations levels to even understand what it is. So yeah, again, lots of kind of misconceptions about what it means to be at certain stages. Here's another microdevelopmental experiment. This is a therapeutic dyad. So this is a therapist and a patient speaking over 118 exchanges within a single therapeutic session. And this is tracking both abstraction of what's discussed, the number of themes discussed, and the emotional salience. And what you're seeing is that in a psychotherapeutic dyad, uh, there's tremendous variability in the abstraction and complexity of the language used and the emotional dynamics. So the idea that like, oh, okay, if you're a coach or a therapist and you're getting self-authored people who took a Keegan test and they determined that they were self-authored and therefore you're going to treat them in therapy like self-authored people, right? Maybe, maybe not. Depending how emotionally triggered they are and what you're talking about and what the dream was last night, you could end up being way down and speaking with them at representational levels, getting rich descriptions of their parents' house or dinner table, right? So you have to think in a very complex way when you're thinking developmentally, and very differently actually than, than most of the standard kind of like, here's a ladder of development uh, and your whole person moves through stages, which can be given labels like colors and things. All right, so that's development is done. How's the time? Do we know what time it is? Yeah, we're <clears throat> two, coming up on the hour. <clears throat> I have uh, 32 minutes left. 32 minutes left. All right, I think I'm actually going to hold this one and do it at the next one and take questions on what I just spoke to. Because I think if we keep moving forward and there's conf like certain basic confusions with what was previously spoken, uh, then, then I don't want to do that. So I'm going to hold this. This one will only take about maybe 15 minutes or something at the beginning of the next one. And then we can move into the practicum. It will also give me an opportunity to put a couple of slides together about what I want to do in the practicum that I can show you right before we begin it, uh, which will be useful. Um, cool. So let's switch out of this and into kind of questions and exchange. Fantastic. So Scott had a question. Scott, would you like to ask your question? Oh, I can't hear you, Scott. Still nothing. Maybe write it into the chat box, Scott. I can ask, I can ask Scott's question for him. Okay. And so his first question, <clears throat> Pierce's categories are connected to stages or phases. Firstness is exemplified by icons, secondness by indices or contrast. Thirdness is symbol, bodies of knowledge, and libraries. How are these related to your categories? Totally. Yeah, no, the, well, there's two things there. One is that there's the Persian triple being related to stations and stages. And then there's the Persian triple read as a semiotic and how that relates to the three or to psychology in general. Uh, and so it's, it's true that you can lay out one, two, three horizontally as I did transcendence and soma development. But if you look within, let's say development and that figure that I showed you that Kurt made with the dot and then the line, the barbell, and then the square, and then the cube. You can interpret that also along the triple, right? Firstness, literally the one dot. <laughs> Secondness, the two dots. Thirdness being the system. And then the new firstness is also the next role of the third, right? So then that's actually a saying from alchemy. Uh, first followed by the second, which is followed by the third, which is followed by the fourth, which is another one. Anyway, it's a weird mystical saying, but the idea being that the triple rolls over and it come, becomes the new firstness. Um, so you can see the person in categories development and moving that way. Uh, and then, you know, I haven't run the kind of like Persian symbol index uh, icon with these three. I'm wondering 
if it's worth trying to think about doing it right now. I mean, he had a very different terminology, right? So the symbol for him would be with language. I think the icon might be image and the um, index might be uh, the, what we're calling a symbol in my language. So I'd have to work that out. This probably isn't the place to do that, but I think the what I just did might be correct, but now I can't even remember it. Yeah, we can't hear you, Scott. I have a feeling you're asking very difficult questions, so I feel like it's probably good for me that your pointed criticism can't come through. All right, sorry about that, Scott. So we'll, we'll move on to another question. Uh, Sam C, you had a question. Let me unmute you. Go ahead. Hi, Zach. Hey, man. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the role of emotions in your framework. Uh, you talked last time about emotion regulation in transcendence to, you know, like this anti this this identified yourself and put your attention into what you got to do i understand that but i see also emotions as um as a guide for motivation in deliberate practices in in the developmental realm and also as a guide for the intuition that guides you into the installment process. So how, how, how do you see emotions moving into your framework? Or how do you work with them? And how do you alchemically purify them so they are the guide and you just don't dis disidentify with them? Mm, totally. Yeah, very, very good question. And you're right to see emotion uh, kind of touching on all three, which is to say, when you view emotion from development, or you, or you could view emotion from installment, or you could view emotion from transcendent, if you want to kind of hold them as frames like that. And so, yeah, in the, in the transcendent, you're looking at phase shifts in emotion that have to do with the exercise of will in the control of emotion. And that's the most one of the most basic elements. And that's aided through symbol, and as I said, the, depersonalization, transpersonalization, those kinds of things. Um, and so that's kind of like, we kind of get that. In soulmate, it's actually much more complicated because in soulmate, you're you're trying to actually kind of let go of the will to go down and into emotion. Uh, and so like, as I was saying, when you're crying and your imagination is spontaneously producing images of the thing that you're crying about, um, that's tremendously informative information. Uh, just as a dream is, but a dream is also not willed. You're not willing the dream and dreams can be in tremendously emotional. So the notion of insolment is actually like to find a way to kind of quote unquote, explore emotions, to go into the underworld of emotion, um, which is easier to do if you have strong transcendent practice, right? So, and so those kind of interanimate, but the more I can explore an emotion through insolment, the more I can learn to work with emotion in the domain of the transcendent. So this is one of the notions of Tantra, basically, right? That actually, you don't want to stop anger from arising. You actually sometimes want to make anger arise precisely so they have the opportunity to work with it. <laughs> uh, and so that's that dynamic. And then in development, that's where you get um, a whole bunch of kind of cognitive behavioral therapy, script rewriting. There's a whole bunch of things you can do that actually turn emotion and reveal its linguistic and cognitive dimensions. So that's worth, and so that's like one branch of it. And the other branch is that uh, you actually need cognition and often a whole bunch of kind of reflective and cultural kind of assets to understand the image and the emotion that comes with image. So like the craziest things that happen is when people have dreams and the dreams like, and of course this is classic Jung, uh, the dreams just, it's a fucking myth. Like it's literally a myth from some ancient culture <laughs> and they have never heard this, never read it or anything like that. And they go to a psychologist or a friend or whatever, or they even Google the image that came to them and they get this whole thing. And then they start in the, they went from, okay, you spontaneously given an image 
in the process of installment. And it forces you in the domain of development to build a whole bunch of knowledge about the world and a whole bunch of like reframing of like history and causality. Like how do you even have that dream and like a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so that that's the kind of place where in the domain of development, sometimes you need to be equipped there to be able to basically work with image. Um, and like I said, one of the basic processes of extracting the symbol from the image to go transcendent and change phase of emotion, that's a like you can't identify the symbol in the dream unless you're a Jungian psychologist and you've read 30 books on <laughs> like, you know, channel mythic archetypes. Um, so there's that dimensionality where cognition aids in transcendence as well by being able to identify a universal uh, pattern. So, so yeah, awesome question. Thank you. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, Scott. Scott. Uh oh, all right. Yeah, I, uh, I just, I, I guess I'm getting a bunch of beeps and stuff. So, um, but what I was going to say is that the symbolic was was for Per's thirdness, and and to him it signified something like libraries, like accumulated knowledge and right. and understanding, um, and secondness was indices. Um, which would be contrast. It would be uh, how do you come up with a measurement system to decide what you're going to theorize about and so forth. Firstness would be sort of what you want to get back to, which is everything is cool and and you know there are no there are no particular problems and stuff like that, and you're just being and and maybe you're being in ecstasy or something like that and it's a, and the and the contrast is suddenly the ecstasy stops and you yeah. and you want to do something about that you want to get back to the ecstasy or something yeah. and yeah. Uh, the second the second question i had um had to do with uh how does um how does McLuhan's tetrad uh fit into this the the notion of the um uh, enhancement, I'm sure, figures into it in terms of development, uh, uh, a technological enhancement that in turn changes the mentality, uh, acts on the brain, rewires the brain. Um, it obsolesces something that had gone before. So a bunch of behaviors and habits that we have become used to are no longer relevant and they go into the past. We retrieve something from the past uh, um, we retrieve a bunch of habits and stuff like that because of the new technology, but it relates to something that we've experienced before mm -hmm. have forgotten. And then finally, the notion of reversal, which is the, the way I see it is uh, when something is pushed past its limit, when you haven't defined limits for it, like let's say you haven't really defined limits for anti-racism when you've achieved it. So at a certain point, you push it past its limit and anti-racism becomes racism. So it does the opposite of what you originally intended for it to do. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it. Uh, so that's an interesting characterization of Persa's triple. Uh, and you could see just from listening to that, how it might slot in to the three that I'm speaking to. McLuhan's is, is deeper and a little bit more interesting because it's both how does that phenomenon affect the three, which is to say, how is ensoulment different now in the digital as opposed to the electric, as opposed to the uh, Gutenberg galaxy, as opposed to the oral, right? So that's fascinating. If the three have always existed as the basic dimensions of psyche, how have we been reconfigured in our psychical unfolding in these different kind of environments of technology and media. So that's like a whole huge door to open and think about. Um, and then his more detailed work on enhancement, retrieval, uh, and what was the other one? Enhancement, retrieval. Uh, uh, enhancement, um, obsolescence, retrieval, and right. reversal. Reversal, you're in retrieval. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. I have to think more about that. Um, that would allow us to answer a little bit 
about that prior question about what's so different now during the digital um, and both across development and Solman and transcendence. So that's pretty heavy. Cool. Thank you, Scott. I'll put it on my docket to interanimate with McLuhan a little bit more. And Jen, you had a question. Hey, Zach. Um, hey. Um, my dad's a psychiatrist. And so this feels like a very important moment for me to have so many of these things that I learned at the dinner table come to me at such a, such a level of principle and abstraction and understanding. So thank you. Um, my question is, I've been similarly stunned by Greg Henrik's work um, that I've come across this year. I'm trying to figure out how to mesh that with what you're saying. Um, I'd be very curious to hear you talk about that. I was just speaking to Greg Hendricks about that question uh, on Monday or Friday. I can't remember. Uh, I mean, basically, they're they're both uh, meta psychologies. So, like, um, they're both operating in that domain between the special sciences and fields of psychology and what's often called metaphysics or philosophy. So, in that sense, they're in the same family of work um, and. Uh, I see them more or less as complementary. Detailed work to do where I could take parts of Henrik's model and show how my triple arises within the architecture of his frame. Um, so I think that's work that could be done, which I'm not going to do here. So far, I haven't seen any places where like my model suggests that there's inadequacies or absences. I think it actually might be the reverse. Um, I think the main difference is probably aesthetic, which is to say, I think Greg is much more attempting to address scientists in the fields of psychology to get them to attempt to basically change the way they understand their own scientific practice. Uh, whereas I'm not attempting to do that basically at all. <laughs> I'm attempting to speak to people like y'all uh, who are interested in the field of psychology, especially to try to help themselves and others navigate uh, an increasingly crisis ridden and kind of frightening and uh, fascinating world. Um, so I'm, I'm much more in that dimension trying to kind of like go an end around from the academy and go directly kind of to the people. So in that sense, maybe it's a little bit more Wilberian that I'm just trying to say, okay, psychology, like, and so Greg has his work cut out for him, I think, because it's very difficult to move in the established fields of psychology and to try to get them to change their practices, which many of which by virtue of Greg's modeling look absurd, like category errors <laughs> and definitional inadequacies and methodological uh, like um, fiction, basically. Uh, so in that respect, I love the, Greg's work. Um, uh, but I do think mine might be a little bit less ambitious in that respect and a little bit more aesthetically focused to be um, uh, directly useful to non-specialists in psychology or something, something like that. Uh, but I'm continuing to try to think about that detail work and figure out how I can kind of like incorporate more of Greg's modeling into the aesthetics of my kind of like framing. Um, that probably be one way to think about it. But I'm very happy that, yeah, his is getting the attention it deserves. You know, and Wilbur's Integral Psychology, I think, is another one of that kind of scope. And there's a couple other pretty interesting ones. Elliot Jacks is, um, uh, you know, the one laid out in Revisioning Psychology uh, by James Hillman. I thought about at the beginning of this putting up a list of books of like comparable metapsychological projects, but um, I didn't. So, so that's a little bit to that. Uh, my sense is that at some point, maybe Greg and I will write together or do a call where we both speak and do some of that detailed work and then also show that irrespective of how the detail work hashes out, there's an alignment of focus. And a lot of what we're saying is, is, is very identical in fact. Um, so cool, thank you. If you don't mind me asking a quick follow-up, Mm -hmm. um, as a layman with both of these in my head, um, do you have a helpful way of kind of slotting them together, like axes or ways? Because I, I'm, I'm struggling sometimes with 
both of the thoughts in the last two weeks coming to mind. Totally. Well, the first thing I'll say is like to have that struggle is an awesome struggle to have. Like that's the, the Kabbalists say something like, you know, difficulties in the realms of delight, you know? So it's like when you're working at meta levels with those types of models, you have to understand that like the task demand of that cognitively is like, it's huge. So that you're confused makes me think you're doing a good job. <laughs> this is the advice I tend to give. If you figured it all out, you probably didn't. If you're confused, it means you're actually in the learning process. Uh, so that's my first bit of advice, which is like, don't try to figure out quickly. Um, that these are actually really big, rich models and trying to interanimate them um, could be complex and difficult. My general sense would be uh, a couple fold. One is that, um, you know, you can slot a lot of the stuff into Greg's model. There's, it's actually full of triples already. Um, uh, so you could identify that. That's one basic move is to just take Greg's model as primary and to go hunting through it for transcendence and soul and development. Basically use mine as a category scheme to try to like slightly recategorize him. So that's one way to go. Um, you know, I think you can use the work I'm doing in development to actually shore up some of Greg's models uh, where he doesn't bring in Piaget and other folks like that. So there's a good actual additional um, kind of amendment or appendix to Greg's model, which would be something like that talk I just gave on development, which doesn't contradict anything of what he said, but actually unpacks a lot of how development actually formally takes place. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a little bit, but the main thing I would say is yeah, just keep reading Greg's work. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't written anything as in depth. Uh, so, but I'd, yeah, I'd be curious, um, yeah, reaching, you know, getting Greg and I together to speak, I think might be a good idea. Although we may just confuse you more. So but we'll see. Thank you, Andre. Um, Ari had a question. Go ahead and ask it. Hey, brother. Hey, Zach. How you doing, buddy? All right. So I, you know, the chapter five of your book talks about this Gaffney's unique self theory. And I think that my question is more like how it, how that chapter and this conversation relates to my own confusion as to what spiritual development looks like through the Buddhist thing, you know, it's like, I, I felt very validated by reading that because I like the idea of dissolving into nobody doesn't really entice me that much <laughs> for whatever reason. And so I was hoping you could like, I don't know, help me kind of understand the postmodern conception of spiritual development and what those two lenses might lend. Totally. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so a few things on that. One is uh, this essay by James Hillman in the book, uh, Puer and Synex. Um, and it's about the difference between soul and spirit, which is very important, which is actually a difference that exists in a whole bunch of traditions, but which was written out of the kind of Catholic church. They outlawed images as well. <laughs> uh, so it's worth noting that the idea of something like life, mind, soul, spirit, something like that as a kind of great chain of being, if you want to go there. And the difference between insolment and transcendence being the difference between work at the level of soul and work at the level of spirit. And so in that essay by Hillman, which is like beautiful, I think it's called Peaks and Vales or something like that, which is Peaks and Valleys. In the essay by Hillman, he gives this excerpt from a letter from the Dalai Lama where the Dalai Lama is trying to basically explain the differences between these different forms of practice, basically between soul work, which actually exists in some forms of Buddhism and spirit work, which also exists in some forms of Buddhism. And so he said like, 
you know, once there were these beautiful, he tells a story, an image actually, he paints an image, which is interesting. Uh, once there were these beautiful monks and they went to this valley and they set up a monastery and the valley was lush with greenery and there were streams going through it that had mud in it and there was light and there was dark and they chanted and it was awesome. And then a few monks, uh, even more beautiful, went up <clears throat> into the mountains out of the valley. The plants disappeared. The glaciers were there, kind of like just geometric perfection. A single flower bloomed with like ornate beauty and they set up a monastery and they did no chanting, right? And it was even better. So that's his way of like painting an image of the difference between soul and spirit work, right? Where the soul work is the work in the valley with all these different shades of green and light and darkness and the muds and the valley and all of those things. Uh, and the spirit work is that work that takes place high up in the kind of geometric perfection of the glaciers, um, kind of where there's only light uh, and sounds travel very far and this single flower blooms. Uh, and so generally speaking, like a practice like Zen Buddhism, for example, or Vipassana meditation, um, or many of what Wilbur would call the ascending paths, even certain forms of contemplative prayer and uh, Jungian symbol work, um, that this stuff takes place up on the peaks where uh, basically a totally amazing, beautiful forms of transpersonal experience can take place. Um, but that's not the full dimensionality of psychic growth that's possible. Um, and so there's the dimension of work that's ensoulment based, which is also transpersonal work, which is also to say it's technically speaking spiritual. <laughs> it's not it's in the realm of soul and there's spiritual work that's in the realm of Work in the realm of soul is not less transpersonal. Um, it's just, uh, again, not an up and out into an impersonality, but a down and in into a uniqueness, right? And so Gaffney's model, originally articulated a book called Soul Prince, um, is that notion that, yes, the transcendence is huge, but you, you don't go up to the peak and then stay up at the peak. You go up to the peak and then you actually come back down. Like it's not mountain climbing works. You can't live on the peak by definition. Uh, it's quite inhospitable, uh, um, but gorgeous views. Uh, you have to get down, get back in to the valley. So the notion of unique self is that you need to disappear into oneness and experience the lack of cognition, lack of object awareness, lack of self-identity story, just bodily attention and consciousness as such, like important experience even for emotional self-regulation and knowing what the nature of self uh, is like. Uh, but that is actually reintegrated uh, into whatever process of ensoulment you are at going down and into your life. And so the risk of joining the beautiful monks up on the peaks uh, is that you can get stuck up there. Um, and so you see people with these kind of dual life kind of trajectories where the sense of having to flee the world to go live on the peak is the only way to be spiritual. Um, uh, and so that notion of bringing the soul and spirit practices together was what Hillman was trying to recommend. And uh, so in a concrete way, if you're working with your attention and your consciousness and symbol as part of your practice, then you're doing spirit work, transcendence, which is great. If you're working with image, imagination, personality, uh, and archetypal imagery in particular, then you're doing installment work. Uh, and if you're building the cognitive apparatus, which by the way is sometimes a lot more important <laughs> given how complex the world is, like I'm always like, maybe read some long ass books instead of meditating all day. Uh, that's another conversation. You also need to work in that domain of development or else all of that stuff, as deep as your consciousness has become, uh, your equipped 
you know, to do very little because you don't have the languages and the cognitive capacity and the fidelity with objects in the world and stuff. Um, so all three need to be going. Uh, and so, yeah, if you're doing that language, cognition, capacity. So just think like how much of my practices are in the domain of working with my own awareness to use the will to regulate my emotion and how much of my practices are in the domain of activating constructive imagination, working with images, moving through stations, deepening personality like they're just, they're related, but they're distinct. As you see that in Buddhism and then the higher yoga tantras, like Ashrihana, um, things like that, where they engage with imaginal exercises and archetypal imagery uh, very directly. Um, but you find it in most traditions in some way or another. All right, so one more question. Thank you, Ari. Right, no question. Love it, thanks. Okay, I, so one more question, Zach? One more question, I'll do it, to try to do it quick. All right, uh, so Chris, Chris Eddy had a question. Chris. What's up, how's it going? Yeah, I wanted to ask, it could be formulated in a few ways, but the way I wrote it was, what are the open questions you have about the formulation of the metapsychology, both from a theoretical and a practical standpoint? Um, so what do you feel you need to clarify about it? You know, what kind of images do you have for it? Uh, like, what do you wish it would become? Things like that. Hmm. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I think mostly what I'm feeling a need for as I speak it with y'all is to write about it. Um, cause it is, uh, slippery, feels slippery. <laughs> like as I speak about it, like I think I'm giving clarity and I think it's coming across, but I also think that, um, there's a difference between speech and text. Uh, so I think putting it into some written form will be quite powerful. Um, you know, most of my open questions have to do with, well, there's two sets. There's the detail work which is like I describe like, okay, does this actually work? Like, okay, let's take this psychological model, see if I can, oh, I make sense of it, great. Like, and basically run it through some iterations of application across fields of psychology uh, and questions in psychology, which is what we're gonna start doing next week with the practicum. Like, um, if we can't solve basic <laughs> problems staring us in our face that have to do with our own psyche with the metapsychology, then it's not worth anything. So it needs to be, tested we need to kick the tires and and really see if it's going to work as an applied psychology um and then i'd also like to see uh yeah basically you know i think for me it's about what actually could work in our culture to get the mental health crisis uh resolved or at least um, stop it from continuing to get worse. Um, and so that's much broader question than my metapsychology. I actually have no pretense of thinking I, that this work will do that. But when I think about like, what's the vision is that, is that we need to figure out some way like um, to stop this cascading uh, pattern of um, which the psyche is kind of like embroiled in. And so it's like, but how do we do that? Well, it's with the psyche. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> so it's like, they're, so it's like, we have to find a way to, to again, get the psyche to like throw water on its own face or to like look in the mirror somehow. So what, what does that actually look like at a cultural level? Um, aside from like war, uh, I don't know. And so most of what I'm doing is in attempt to just like fumble in those directions, uh, which um, which hopefully, you know, the next generation will pick up or this generation will pick up and experiment with. Um, so that that's a little bit of how I, of how I see it. Uh, at this point, it's super nascent. There needs to be writing done. There needs to be application, thinking about all the things. And then there needs to be thinking about, you know, the broader field of effect that one would, would want to uh, get going. So cool. Thank you, Chris. Um, so 
that's all she wrote. Same time next week, uh, we'll wrap the transcendence slides. And then my invitation would be to not bring questions about the model. You can, but bring questions about the world that the model could be used to address. And then we'll learn more about the model as we try to address it. And the world includes your own neuroses and minds uh, and pathologies. And the world also includes culture, um, uh, media landscapes, uh, entertainment artifacts, all kinds of stuff. So I'm totally open to fielding and having conversations about some interesting stuff next week um, and seeing how the model kind of works. So it's a lot of fun, guys. I really appreciate this opportunity. It's been great to see you. Thank you so much, Zach. I'm going to tag uh, Peter in. Cool. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Zach. Um, just going to plug uh, a few events. Uh, one coming up at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time, which I'll put in the chat right now. <clears throat> so we're having a, a series called Postscript where there's a platform called letter.wiki. They have exchanges people have debates on in the letter format. And so we're teaming up with them and having uh, like post letter exchanges at the STOA. And there's one on toxic masculinity with Buster Benson, author of uh, Why Are We Arguing? And then John Davis, uh, he has his blog, uh, YouTube channel called War Elephant. He's a former Marine. And they're basically gonna argue, the question is, um, is the, the term toxic man uh, masculinity more helpful or, or more harmful? Um, so that is going to be tonight at 6.30 p.m. It should be feisty. And then uh, with Richard, Richard Bartlett and Ronan Harrington, uh, they're coming in tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, Eastern time, and they're having a, a workshop on depolarizing conversations. So that should be pretty cool. So I'll uh, take Nick back in. Great. Thank you, everybody. Hope to see you next week for the third session. Uh, how, how, how does one how does one get on the Discord server? Yeah, I will uh, um, put that in the chat right now. Uh, okay, cool. Right. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next week for another session.